One of the most powerful ways to induce a deep level healing in a person's life is to receive them, to fully and completely receive them. And the other way is to remember them and to acknowledge their prior existence and their contributions. I'd like you to sit back, relax, light a candle, get a cup of tea or a glass of water and receive this. We'll begin with a short piece of beautiful harp music. Welcome to Healing for All Time, a segment of its rainmaking time. Is that pretty or is that pretty? Welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. We are streaming live, healing for all time. And you have been listening to a miraculous Stephen Reese from Australia with his calming harp, 528 frequency. He and his wife travel all over the world doing storytelling and playing harp. And you'll want to go to his site and check that out at calmingharp.com. I think it's very important to support artists and creative people at a time when so much of the world is suffering and struggling. We really have to assist each other as artists to get our work visible and to give it as much exposure as possible. Because without artists, where would we be? I'm Kim Greenhouse, for those of you who don't know me. And we are streaming this live on itsrainmakingtime.com, experimenting with a live stream, and also on YouTube. It's new for us, and I'm here with the consummate professional Bruce Barker. And right after this studio, he's a voiceover specialist, a producer, and has had his own show for years off and on, and he co-hosts different types of shows, and he works with people in the area of voiceover. He's been a dear friend and a dear brother to me and has helped me so much in my broadcasting life. Thank you, Bruce. I was thinking about doing healing for all time because I'm fascinated with healing, and after interviewing so many healers in the area of well-being and consciousness, the body, and in the spirit, and... It's a great love of mine and a great interest. What is it about the body, mind, and spirit that either works together or doesn't work together to produce not just unwellness of the body, but unhappiness and uh, a lack of joy in the spirit? And I said, there's got to be something that would enable humanity to have a kind of breaststroke, like a broad-based but a deep cleanse of everything that has preceded us and every wrongdoing that has ever been it will be even in the now and no i don't have a messianic complex (laughs) but i asked that question and what occurred to me is that we need to name the things that have happened throughout time We need to name the scenarios that people are suffering over and say goodbye to it. Discharge the energy that's still alive. For many of you, many of you may or may not know, but quantum physics and science is showing us that 
a world that we thought was inanimate is in fact animate. It's alive, particularly in the area of water science, where we know that you can clean the chemicals of the water, but the water still has a signature frequency. The great Nikola Tesla told us, if you pay attention to, inter to vibration and frequency, you'll understand everything you need to really pretty much understand. I'm paraphrasing. And it's also true in the area of healing. But this part of healing, while there's all these great new innovations, it hasn't yet integrated itself in the modern day. In other words, we know about all these disciplines of yoga and breathing and this modality and this device and all of these capacities and meditation and writing down your dreams and taking care of yourself and juicing and all this stuff and take this vitamin and take that and communicate and own your emotions and be responsible for your life. But when you really look into the world, you still see that even with the information, there's a great deal of suffering and unhappiness and a high level of charge emotionally. And so the concept of business is business in business, I laugh at that because some of the most mean-spirited things that are done in the world are done in a business level where business is not just business. It has an emotional tone. It has an emotional communication. And you could have easily seen this carried out in the election cycle in the United States. I'm not a political person, but you can see what has gone on, that the public has been charged up and brought into this scenario to such an extent that if you go on the social media, you go on Twitter and you go on Facebook, you will see such fighting and angst and unhappiness. It is incessant conflict. And so I ask the question, we all want peace. Many of us, let's just say, want peace. But for many of us, it seems too remote. Yes, I can have peace if I'm meditating in my private dwelling. I can have peace if I'm meditating with others. But in the day-to-day -day out in the world, you don't get a lot of evidence of that. In fact, you get a lot of discord, a lot of lack of harmony. We have a lot of notes that are not in accord. And so I ask myself, what is this about? How come we as a civilization can't get through it? that there's this base level lack of harmony. And I started to think about, I've been working on my book when I was in Berlin for a year. I started writing my book on my life, uh, my life as a pioneer and as an artist, creative person, and as a businesswoman. And I really started to see a lot of things about the world and about discord. I really started to understand things. It's funny when you put something down when you write something. And I want to share a couple of cute stories about some childhood fun memories that really have to do with being an artist and conflict and also to do with discord because many of you listening may find that who you were as a child, that magical child that you were, that not caring kind of relaxed and easy to flow with things and could be very creative that you learn through school and you learn through programming and you learn through television and you learn through music that was encoded in your subconscious daily to receive discord, to expect discord and to be ready for discord. And we don't even think about it. We're all programmed for discord, and that means we are basically open and ready for conflict at all times. And because the media in general, the advertising field, has become masterful at subliminal communication, including the music industry, you know, they have learned how to sell you the meta messages they want you to ingest and to receive and to assimilate and to function from. And these meta messages all touch 
any kind of wounding, any kind of emotional issues, any kind of unfinished business with your past, with people, places, and things. And so to be a conscious being today, no matter how conscious you are, it's very important to remember that you are encoded by society, at least in a modern society, to expect, to receive, to be addicted to conflict. And so I just want to bring this up and then I want to share with you a little bit about being an artist, some cute stories. Because many, many years ago, somebody came up to me and said, you know, you're an artist. You know, you're a writer and an artist and a speaker. And I said, don't you ever talk to me like that. <laughs> don't you ever talk to me like that. I'm a businesswoman. Don't you know it? And I was in my, I think, my mid-20s or early 30s, and, and I didn't want to be an artist. I was very insulted. How dare you talk to me like that? And then I was standing in line in a post office in 2003. My father had just passed away. There's a very, very long line behind me, and I get up into the line, and I said, I'll have some stamps. And the woman says, oh, why don't you take a look at these stamps? I want you to see which ones you like. We have some really good stamps. So I look at the stamps and I went, oh, my God, you have a Houdini stamp. And I'm all excited. I'm standing in the line. I'm going on about Houdini and who made the decision at the post office to put Houdini on a stamp. <laughs> and the, the woman was fine, but the people behind me were like, get this woman out of here. Get out of here. Come on, lady. Let's go. You know, I'm like, don't you understand? Houdini's in the post office. They had no idea. But anyway, so when I walked out of there, something said to me, only you would do that. And that's because you're an artist, lady. I get it. And maybe that person who came up to you and said you're an artist was right. So years went by and I'm at a Thich Nhat Hanh workshop, three or five day workshop at Deer Park Monastery. And when you complete the workshop with Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist monk, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King. I went there for peace, right? <laughs> I mean, we won't talk about the second time that I went to a, a, peace, a, a peace event and I smashed somebody in the shoulder who wouldn't move. <laughs> but anyway, we won't get into that. That's a whole separate story, <laughs> a separate event. But anyway, you get something at the end of the workshop that is like a certificate. It says you are trained in this kind of engaged Buddhism, and he gives you a name. So Thich Nhat Hanh gave me the name Artist of the Heart. And when I got that, it was the first time I got it. I couldn't figure it out. I'm not a painter, right? I, I mean, what kind of artist am I anyway? When, what, what is my art? So I said, well, I'm a rainmaker. That's what I am. I'm a rainmaker. And then I walked around telling people that and they were like, okay, thank you very much. But I said, no, I am. I really am. Anyway, to make a long story short, I'm going to tell you one story and then we're going to go into the more serious part of this. When I was a young girl, I had a very, very, very close friend named Cindy. I won't mention her last name in case she's frightened to death. But what I'm going to say we were very good friends, and one day in the afternoon, we went to our friend Nancy's house. We walked a few blocks and went over to Nancy's house, and we were taking art in school, and I couldn't draw at all. I drew stick people, but we were learning about Van Gogh and the other like famous master artists. So Nancy said, why don't you both stay here in my bedroom, and I'll be back. I have to get some supplies. Well, in Nancy's bedroom were paintbrushes and watercolor and water to clean the brushes. And I looked around and I looked at all four walls and I said to Cindy, hey, Cindy, these walls are white. We have our easel. We're ready to go. <laughs> Let's do it. And I put my paintbrush into the paint and I start, I, I literally thought I was Van Gogh. I just started painting Nancy's walls in her bedroom. And she came back in the room, I don't know if it was five minutes or 10 minutes later, and screamed her guts out. Oh my God, what have you done to my bedroom, mom? Oh my God, and she ran out screaming. I thought, what did I do? 
what did I do? I'm Van Gogh. I'm I'm working on my masterpiece. And somehow, somehow I had a slight blur between in my imagination and reality. And I think that that is where we're going to do a little bit of talking here. The imagination is an active facility for everything of the spirit, everything creative, and including a connection directly into the heart. You're not, you're not going to hear this much because the imagination is kind of relegated to this thing. But it has something to do with the mind, the spirit, and the heart. And when you ha come from a family that feeds that spirit, that kind of openness and imagination, a lot of things can happen. You go through a process of life where you can create things and they can go or they can flop and you can create things and you don't have to apologize for what you're creating. And I think we're living in a world where a lot of people are scared of their imagination and therefore they use the left brain to mask things that are popping in. There's a lot of things that pop into the imagination that are future oriented, that are directly related to time of future events coming. And you can say, well, you know, we know from the remote viewing work and other types of work in consciousness at Stanford Research Institute and other institutes that there's no such thing as time. But we know that there's something called happening before, happening now, happening after now. And that time is dimensional. So time has a direct relationship with our imagination. And this is important because the imagination is a indwelling for future projection of things that are coming, not just the world of fantasy that we've been taught. Imagination has never properly been translated in my experience. Why am I bringing this up? Because as an artist, the imagination is the indwelling, is the space in which all the direction is given to the artist. I want to take a few minutes and I would like to just have people call in and just say hello and extend your warm wishes or your well wishes if you'd like to. You don't have to talk about yourself. You don't have to sell us anything. It's just a hello. We're here if you would like to say hello. We know that there are people in Australia and right now there are people in South Africa listening, which we appreciate it. There's somebody in France that got up that thinks she's with a Buddhist monastery and she's listening. What I would like to do is to go through a couple of other stories with you about healing. There may be things that you don't want to be. There may be situations that you don't want to be in that are hurting you. And there are situations that society has instructed us we should not be in. There's like this meta message in society. You shouldn't be broke. You shouldn't not have money. You shouldn't be overweight. You should look this way. You should be living with this person. You should be married to that person. All these different types of you shoulds. These are also encoded in the messages of radio and television where we sit passively and we receive these messages and imprints into our subconscious. We've been told that the subconscious is 90, maybe 95% in operation and the conscious mind is 5% in operation or 10% in operation. To know that is to know that the subconscious is taking things in without your permission by the conscious mind. So that's why 
when you watch television and you listen to radio, it's very important what you're taking in. Even your advertisements that you think that your passive running in the background are imprinting something, not only the frequency in which the message is being communicated, but the language, the conversation, everything in the background, your subconscious is taking in, even though you're not paying attention to it. And so many of us live lives that we think we have charge over that are in a trance, a kind of a trance. Somebody has called in. There's Lauren from California. Would you like to say hello and bring Lauren in, please, to its rainmaking time? Thanks for being here. Hi, Kim. Thank you for calling. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just great that you're doing this. Thank you very much. Thanks yes. for being here. Is there anything else you want to say? or? Oh, continue. I'm listening. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Lauren. That's Lauren from California calling in. I want to share something else with you. When I was in business at Concord Communications, a telephone answering service in Beverly Hills, there was a man that was renting an office from us there named Bill. And he was a publicist, very funny, very charming guy. And I used to go in and talk with him all the time on breaks and very relaxing. And one day I was joking around with Bill, walked in, sat in in his office. And I don't know how we got to the subject, but he said to me, if I were to get into major debt, I would just kill myself. And I said, what? He goes, oh, totally. I, I mean, it would be the end of my life. I mean, I just couldn't face anybody. I would just take my own life. And I ended up sitting in that office with Bill for like two hours with him. And about three weeks later, he had taken his life. And why am I telling you that? Because you never know when you're talking to somebody, no matter what their game face is, what they're struggling with unless they tell you. And there are a lot of people in this world right now who are suffering and struggling silently because they're embarrassed, like Bill was, that they're not making it. And not only they're not making it, they're, in their view, failing. They're failing their families. They're failing society. They're failing themselves. Some feel they're failing their parents, their brothers, and their sisters. And they don't want to be here anymore. And so I want to speak to the souls in this time and times before us who have been in pain so much that they wanted to leave. And I just want to say I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you left that way, that nobody could get to you, that you had to leave like that. There are millions of people, maybe billions of people who are in this position. And as the holidays intensify the emotional field, be aware of people suffering. You don't know. Forget their game face. Okay? People put on the game face and you don't know. We have Benjamin here from Portland, Oregon on line two. Go ahead, let him through, and then we'll bring in Maggie. Hello, Kim. Hi, Benjamin. Oh, such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for calling in. Yeah, thank you for giving voice to what you what you continue to give voice to. It's certainly a, a wonderful opportunity to feel those things spoken into space and to feel you addressing the the suffering and and the power of our heart and our love in the face of it thank you so much i really appreciate it god bless you hmm. <laughs> it's rain making time <laughs> yes it is <laughs> very much benjamin thanks kim okay and bring in Maggie from Massachusetts. Hi, Maggie. I also just want to chime my signature in and say how refreshing and consoling it is to hear your perspective. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. It's rainmaking time. It's rainmaking time. 
I would like to speak to the celebrities who might be listening. I share a major issue that a lot of celebrities, even though I'm not, quote, a celebrity in the celebrity sense. I became a celebrity when I was a very young girl in my tournament tennis career. And life became very serious at nine Training with Pancho Segura, getting into tournaments for 13 years, I was trained and inculcated to become a product. I was about to be monetized. I remember at 12 walking into a tournament and in the tournament tennis field, you bring the tennis balls in when you've won the match, you have the balls in your hand, you bring them in, you report to the tournament desk, and you say, your last name, Greenhouse, 6261, or whatever the score was. And On my way up, after I don't know how many matches I had played, and I had been at it uh, five years, five years in, okay? I'm walking up the stairs at the um, Los Cienega tennis courts, and this guy runs down to me and says, what's the score? What's the score? And I was so angry at this guy. I said to him, I screamed at him, why don't you ask me how I am? Why don't you ask me how I feel? Who cares what the score is? And I walked by him. I was furious at him. And at 12, I already had the taste of what it was like to be a celebrity. With a state and national ranking, I was around celebrities all the time. And I felt like I was a thing. I was a merchandisable thing. And my childhood was slipping. And for all of the people out there who might be listening, no matter how old you are, You're going to have moments in your childhood where you lose your innocence. And I don't just mean lose your innocence um, any particular way. But for you, you have this moment of truth where you are no longer the same. You see something, you experience something that informs you so deeply, you're never the same again. You see a taste of life, a side of life that makes you not want to be in this or that field. Well, I went through it being a public person. I became a public person as a child and a teenager and a young adult. And it was rough and it was competitive, insidiously competitive. I grew up in Beverly Hills and it was rugged and it was rough, and I watched people cheat to win, and I watched people cry and have no identity unless they were winning. I saw children turning into these things, that winning at all costs. I saw the influence of celebrity on children. And so, For all of you that have whatever is your innocence that you feel was defiled as a young child, this is a chance to do an invite in healing. Now, I don't perceive myself as a guru. I perceive myself as a human being that's done a lot of work on herself with insight and a contribution to make. This insight I've worked very hard for (laughs) this discernment. I've worked very hard for, for many, many years. And so one of the things I'd like to do is to do an invocation. Now I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. And I pray with people of every tradition. I pray with born again, Christians. I pray with Buddhists, Sufis, Muslims, you name it. Doesn't matter to me. What matters is how people treat each other. That's what matters to me. Kindness, love, togetherness, good heartedness, taking care of each other. That's my religion. If you're receiving this content, this talk, and this communication and some of these stories, and you would like to see this go around the world, 
this is the time to step it up, to sponsor this show, to make a contribution in whatever way that you can. If you can't sponsor it outright, to make contributions to it and to facilitate in whatever way you can. There comes a point where sending people emails and links is great, but there's a time in which we need money to move this thing. And if you want this moved, we need your help. We want to get this message out to hundreds and millions of people across the world. Hundreds and millions of people who are still locked up in their childhood somewhere, who haven't worked out something in the spirit that happened to them. You may know some of them. Some of them may be in politics. Some of them may be heads of industry, heads of big companies. And you never know really how old somebody emotionally is behind the game face that's operating their vessel. I have a dear friend of mine named Pam who produced a movie called Baby It's Cold Outside. She is an incredibly creative woman. She also wrote a book on her life of some interesting things that happened to her. She produced this. She wrote it. She starred in it. And she got it out on DVD. But basically, it's a romantic comedy of about 105 minutes. It's an independent feature film shot on super 16 millimeter. It's about this woman named Holly, who's a hotel manager from South Florida who meets and marries Rob, a successful Christmas wreath maker from northern Maine in the middle of winter. And Holly, who's never experienced snow and freezing water, oh, excuse me, freezing winter before, just really can't stand it. And turns out that Holly's not the only tropical mammal that's out of place because this fuzzy little anteater was brought up to be part of a petting zoo. But when it was discovered that this anteater is not hibernating and could be dying, he was returned to the tropics with Holly. And we want to know what happened to Holly. This is a Christmas movie, great for animal lovers and romantics, suitable for all audiences, and we're delighted to let you know about Baby It's Cold Outside. If you contribute $50 to the show, we will send you Baby It's Cold Outside, a Christmas special, something for your whole family, and you can contact us at timing at rainmaking.com or you can call 626-398-8652. Thank you very much. I really love getting people's stories to fall out of them. These great, rich stories, funny stories, sad stories, revelation stories, things that are so memorable. And I was in an Alzheimer's unit with my mother, who was there as a patient, <laughs> my cousin Carol and Dan, and my older sister, Karen, and I had my tape recorder and I decided I was going to interview Carol and Danny, my cousins, about my mother and father. My father had passed on. My mother was pretty far into her Alzheimer's and Carol was partially starting to lose her memory, but she was very articulate, very funny. And so I want to offer you all a service that I launched in back before I went to Europe, but didn't have time to carry it out. If those of you would like Kim Greenhouse to get your stories, either on audio or video, you can call 626-398-8652 because truly they are the gift that keeps on giving. Check out this clip of me in an Alzheimer's unit with my mother, my cousin Carol and Dan, and my sister Karen. When I was working at Music Corporation of America, which was in Beverly Hills, and, yeah, William, and William Morris was shortly there, a, a little block away, that's when I first really met Joanne. And Buddy is my cousin, of course. And uh, Joanne was very madly in love, and they kind of had a little bit of a spiff, a little 
he got kind of independent and didn't call for a few days. And Joanne got so, so upset. She said, uh, oh, I forgot what when Buddy called. Oh, and she said, Carol, I want you to tell Buddy that I'm in a terrible accident. Oh, oh, I'm whispering. It's getting harder and harder. I'm almost off the No, excuse me, because Joe, <laughs> Joanne wanted to. <laughs> she said, "You better call Buddy <laughs> and tell him." <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't scream. No, you go ahead. Go okay. ahead and relax. Nice and, and relaxed. Uh, there you go. Very Speak relaxed. Out. I want to be relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> and Joanne said, I'm going to tell you call Buddy right away and tell him that I am in an accident. And I'm in, and I'm, and I'm, go, and I'm uh, Carol, she said, <laughs> and I've got a nurse here, and the nurse is wrapping me up like a mummy. <laughs> and I'm going to be, as yeah, she said, and I want him to understand that. And so he'll realize, you know, he better get going. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> And so I'm going to sound like I don't know what I'm saying. And I called Buddy, and I had to be, I, it was very difficult to keep a straight face. What did you say to him? Okay, I called, I said, Buddy, <laughs> I said, I have some news for you. I'm really concerned. Joanne called, the nurse, rather the nurse there. I think she's at some special little home. I think you know where it is. <laughs> and she said, you better, you, be, you better, I called Buddy, and I said, Buddy, you better get over to Joanne. You know, I know, I, he knew where it was, I didn't. And she was in a car accident, and she's calling for you. And I feel so bad about it. And, and please, she, he said, well, where is this? And what? And I said, I gave him the address. <laughs> and and uh, I said, well, I don't know, buddy. I don't know if I can be there because I'll start laughing. He said, you be there. No, that's not the case. That's not wrong. He didn't know anything. He said, will you be there? And I said, yes, I will, Betty. Of course I will. So then I did go over there. And <laughs> was she wrapped up? It, was she wrapped up? She was laying there like a mummy, a total mummy. And I said, Joanne, Joanne. And she said, I can't talk. And I said, well, Buddy's coming over. Buddy's coming over. So wait till you hear this. This is the part that you will be. So <laughs> he rang the bell, and I couldn't <laughs> look. And he walked right in there. And the nurse was there. Joanne was laying there, only her eyes. You saw <laughs> two eye eyes were sticking out. And she was wrapped up like a mummy. <laughs> now, she couldn't talk. So he said, Joe, Joe. He called her Joe. Josie, are you OK? What happened? At first, he was kind of believed a bit. And he looked at her, he looked at her, and he looked at me, and I, I was holding it. I, I didn't know what to do or where to go. I couldn't stand. So, but if you could, if I could show, if, if you could imagine this, he walked over to Joanne. Joanne? And he took his hand and he banged on the, ca on the cast that was supposed to be a cast on the leg. Joanne, does this hurt? Does this hurt? And he was banging all, you know, banging his hand because he knew and that, that that was not, he said, she's not, she's not, she's not, uh, this is not right. But then I think what happened is we all, I started to laugh and he laughed and Joanne couldn't get away with it. We couldn't, we, I'm missing a little bit. He started so. to unravel her, didn't he? Or well, like yeah, he, he had pushed her, he rolled her and he, you, you know, rolled. does it hurt? Well, I mean, he was like moving your arm. Does it hurt? Does it hurt? Am I hurting you? Does it hurt? And you were laughing too. Then you started underneath all the bandages. You were up. Oh, I, I, I can see him. I can just see that face of Buddy's, that teasing face, cute, pushing and rolling and knocking, you know. And, and so that's the story. Oh, and, and that, I remember that so much, Joe. And you. And then what happened? Well, then I think we un he unraveled her all together, and the bandages came off, and she had to get up. And then uh, he said, oh, for Christ's sake, he said one of those, you know, what the hell is you doing here? <laughs> so maybe then he proposed the next day. But no, that's that. No. But no, anyway, never know. Point, you never know what you do. Yeah, yeah. But no, Dan knows very well. He was taking his good old time in popping the question. And then Dan scared him into it and said, you better get going because 
this, uh, what's his name Howard again? Howard Leeds. Yeah, Howard Leeds is after Joanne. You had a lot of boyfriends, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. And so be it. I think it Back. made him go. It was really cute. And that's one story. Now, I will be thinking of some more where I won't have to hesitate so, because I've got a lot on my mind. Thank you very Thank much. It's my pleasure. Live from Houston <laughs> and Los Angeles. <laughs> Wasn't that delightful? That's in an Alzheimer's unit. Now, it's true. Anybody can put a tape recorder in front of somebody, but not everybody has the skills and the practice and the years of experience of inviting in the magic and inviting in these important stories that are part of our family and life legacy. Being a space for this type of a sharing is a skill. And so is inviting in the telling of the stories that, is inform that have informed us throughout our lives. Don't let your stories with your families slip by. Don't let your parents pass on and not capture the magic. Call me, 626-398-8652, and I'll capture the magic of your family. Thank you very much. So I want to talk about this healing invocation. I'm going to do this for the first time in a collective level. I can't see you. Boy, I would love to be able to see you when I'm doing this, but I can't see you right now. I'd like you to get quiet and just take a couple of deep breaths with me. Take three. I'm going to begin to acknowledge all kinds of scenarios, and when I get going, I'll stop when I stop. I would like to send protection, healing energy around all of you listening, all of you that will be listening, and the people around you that may hear you listening to this. I want to thank all of the beings who have ever lived throughout human history who have gone to bat for somebody and gotten in trouble. I want to thank all of the people who have gone to war and died or been brutally injured and were never the same, didn't want to go to war, felt it was wrong, didn't want to kill anybody, and also had to kill somebody. I want to acknowledge all of the people that have survived incest, that have been abused through incest or any type of sexual trafficking, any unholiness with regard to being violated sexually and physically, any women, men, children, brothers, sisters who have been misused and defiled against their will, that have had to internalize silence and suffering for fear of themselves, their family, their lives. I want to apologize to you. I want to thank all of the people that have worked and worked and worked to support their family, all the men and women throughout human history that have supported their families and their in-laws and friends, and been in jobs that they couldn't stand and didn't like and didn't want and had to do time with their life to support their families. And their families or members of their families didn't appreciate them. I want to acknowledge all of the women throughout human history, past, present, and future, that have married men they didn't love, didn't like, and stayed with them because they felt they had to, they didn't want to be alone, they were afraid of something, or this was the best they thought they could get when it wasn't working for them. 
I want to acknowledge all the mothers who stayed in marriages that didn't work for them and fathers that stayed in marriages that didn't work for them and suffered silently and ongoingly when they didn't want to be there and felt pressure from family, pressure from society, and pressure that somehow they wouldn't have the life that they really wanted if they left. I want to honor the people that stayed in their marriages because they loved their partners and they wanted to be with them when the going got rough. I want to thank the people who have fed their relationships with love and kindness and care throughout human history and taken care of each other that may have never, ever, ever been acknowledged. I want to thank the people throughout human history that have had to eat animals and actually cared how those animals were killed, whether they were humanely butchered. I want to acknowledge people that had to butcher animals that didn't want to butcher them, didn't like it, didn't agree with it, and had to put up with it and do it. I want to acknowledge the animals on this planet that are being brutalized all over the world in every country of the world because cultures do not think and feel that animals have conscience and feeling and that they're telepathic and think because they're animals, they don't suffer physically, mentally, in any other way. I want to apologize to those animals who are treated horribly and die suffering so much for no reason other than consciousness and lack of care. I want to apologize to the trees and the forests and our oceans and all the mountains that have been blown up and chopped up and defiled by big business and greed that did not care and does not care what is in its path. It wants what it wants. All of the living, breathing aspects of life that are being decimated by beings that could care less. I want to apologize to everything on this planet for this kind of treatment and for being alive at a time in history when most of the world does not understand and is oblivious to the fact that nature is alive. It's a living being, just like our planet is. I want to apologize to our air, our clouds, our weather systems, which have been so beautiful over time, that have been infiltrated and also are being defiled with chemicals, nanotechnology, and metallic substances, and particulates that are not viable for any living thing on the planet. I want to apologize to our airspace and to a civilization that is being force-fed a diet of this through our air that we don't accept. Many don't know about it. Many are fighting about it. But when you look in the laboratories, we're assimilating it. I want to apologize to all the scientists who are being murdered for coming too close to great solutions and discoveries that are so important, having to do with freeing this civilization of bondage. I want to apologize to you for having given your lives to something and how you've been betrayed by your society, those in power in your society that took away all of your work, took your lives, and then took your work as well. 
I want to apologize to the great inventors of the world, past, present, and future, for having to live in fear and operate in the dark because you know that we're living in a civilization that is run by a military industrial complex that cares not about the civilization, but about controlling access to everything new and ancient knowledge and discovery. I want to apologize to all of the people who have been forced to accept above top secret and the highest level secret clearances in a dark underbelly of a world that is totally and completely out of control. And I want to acknowledge what you have to put up with, what you have to deal with, what you're being asked to contain. I want to speak to what you're suffering about that you're containing and tell you that we know you're afraid that if you don't contain it, you won't be alive anymore or your family won't be alive. And we're sorry. We're sorry you're in that position. We're so sorry. I want to acknowledge the people that our media outlets all over the world are destroying, whose credibility they've destroyed and continue to destroy and defile as if it's nothing, whether it's through tweeting or Facebook communication or emails, or newspapers and magazines, or on the broadcast networks themselves. I want to apologize to you, since they won't, that what they're doing and how they're treating you, they don't understand how they're ruining your lives. They don't get it. They're like a machine. They don't get that they're ruining your lives. I want to apologize to all the people who have tried to do good things and expose wrongdoing, who have had to put up with disinterest, uh, detachment from people that could care less, families that left them, loved ones that left them, children that left them, husbands and wives that left them, society that cast them aside and marginalized them. I'm so sorry, and we're sorry. I want to say this to the people who have been very religious, past, present, and future, that we're so sorry that you've been murdered or butchered or have to live in fear because of your translation for your love of God. We're so sorry you have to live that way. And we know you shouldn't have to live in fear. Take a deep breath with me, everybody. I want to make space for people who are afraid to work together and be together with other people who have your passion and mutual interests to step forward and do what you're doing. I want to acknowledge people that are doing very, very important work that's very dangerous, potentially dangerous to their well-being. I want to thank you for stepping out, putting yourself on the line, and going for it. And when I say dangerous, I don't mean like could hurt anybody. I mean dangerous meaning they're challenging empire. They're challenging the establishment. They're challenging the way things have been set up, the way we think we're supposed to operate. They're stepping out of line to do great and good work. I want to apologize to all of the students in universities throughout the world who are being lied to and are being given false information about our history and our future and are being programmed similarly to the way children are programmed through broadcasting, radio, and television. 
I want to apologize to the students of this world who were told that you have to get a degree, and if you don't get a degree, you won't get a job, who racked up hundreds and thousands of dollars or 50000 or whatever it is of debt that can never be repaid in the traditional jobs that are available. I want to apologize to you. You should never, ever have to go through that, ever. I want to apologize to all of the children and young people who are being forced to get vaccinations, to take drugs every time they don't feel well, that you can't even get in a school anymore without being vaccinated in some parts of the world, many parts of the world. I want to apologize to the civilization that your water supply has been infiltrated, totally infiltrated with drugs. Some are deliberate, some are just from the public sewage system. That in fact, the water you think you're drinking that's clean isn't. And you deserve better. You deserve better. You all deserve better. And nobody's apologizing to you. And so I want to apologize to you. Healing for all time is about erasing, consciously erasing these frequencies of death, destruction, disillusionment, defilement out of history in the same way we would clean water with a filtration device that wiped the frequency of dead water and all of its chemicals from the water. That is happening right now. Right now. I want to apologize to all the people that lived under regimes throughout history where they could, had to be scared to communicate, scared to think differently, afraid to publish, afraid to write, afraid to gather with others and expand their consciousness. They couldn't do that out of fear of death. Living in a suppressed time and place. We are carrying memories from the ancient past, not just the life we're living now, and from the ancient past that's in our cells, that's with us at every level. And I hereby call in the erasure of all of the horrendous emotional experiences, physical experiences that you've had, past, present, and may have in the future. We are erasing the space right now. We are covering this space with God's love, with divine love, and with harmony. And we are re-imprinting harmony and harmonics. We are encoding it as the new normal. And as we gather and as we come together, that organism of consciousness will get bigger and bigger and bigger. For a while, it will feel like we're, you know, dust in the wind, like it's not a loud enough sound. Stay with me here. I'm going to let a few more things come in. I want to apologize to all the people that have been operated on where things went wrong in the operation and they died or they suffered, something happened. I want to apologize to all of the people and animals that have been experimented on consciously by others who thought they had the right to experiment on them and they didn't. And nobody could stop it, including animals today that are being horrendously experimented on. I want to apologize to you, humans, people, animals. I want to apologize for people that have been taken against their will into any scientific facilities anywhere in the world. I 
I won't even say what that's about, but I will just tell you, sorry isn't enough. Our amends is by declaration. We're making amends right now. It's not an excuse. It's not a license to do more. We're making amends right now by building a bridge into the future, the kind of world we want to be in. We can't save everybody. When I say save, I mean it's not fixable. It's transmutable, but it's not fixable as we know it. We have to go ahead and build bridges today and into the future every day building bridges and God will give us our next piece and our next piece and our next piece and our next piece you know when you're connected in with the most high it doesn't matter how you translate it when you're connected in with the most high it's like having a need to know secret clearance <laughs> It's like having a military clearance. You only get to know as much as you get to know. You see? You may have a big picture, but access to the information of how you're led to do good things, great things, is on a need-to-know basis. Why at this time in history... Is healing for all time relevant? Because there is no declaration healing for all time. We are saying we are part of healing for all time. Mind, body, and spirit. It's a declarative stance. We are the people of this world who are standing for the, the rap for all of humankind, all of the suffering of the planet. We are rewriting the codes. We're rewriting the frequencies. Now, right now, you can hear about Tesla cars, but notice you can't hear about Nikola Tesla. You don't get to hear about him and his scalar waves and his weather control inventions that would have helped so many people that's now in different hands. You don't get to hear about him unless you look and dig around. No, you get to hear about the car, but not him. And there's a reason that people like him are lost in human history. Well, you can say, well, he's not lost. Well, guess what? Your children, your families don't go to schools where they learn that at age five, seven. They're not learning it. They're not getting it. They're not being fed this kind of a curriculum because the schools are about programming the minds of youth for something very different. And it's more programming from our childhood. We are calling in the greatest, the most important, imperative solutions, discoveries, creations, facilities, structures, tools, help, the highest level of humankind that can be called into being. We're calling that in. You cannot tell me that you and I live in a world where there's so much food, so many seeds, so much capability and people are starving to death, billions, where there's no food. Look at all this money, black budgets, slush funds, even celebrity money, billions. That is the will of 
improper governments who are not making sure that gets done. Those are governments that are either run by somebody or being told, don't feed them, don't make sure they can eat, don't make sure they have water. When we're moving from a civilization that has been an ownership and control civilization into a transition where we're stewarding what we're stewarding, we will take care of each other. And that means when you're not making money, you don't have jobs, people are retracting. They're afraid in this economy. They're not spending money like they used to. They're not buying things like they used to. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? We're not in the same world anymore. What are you going to do? Even the weather that you hear about is not being told to you correctly and accurately. Your own weather, your climate, what you're hearing about the climate is not being told to you correctly. This is not a political statement. The knowledge you need to know how to navigate what's happening now in the world is not being brought to you in a cohesive whole. So you know how to mobilize and activate at the next level. Some of the structures that you may invest in and you may buy in certain locations because you heard it's cool and it's a great market. If you're missing information, real information about climate and weather or what's happening on the grid, there are things you may be missing and you won't even know to look because you're not looking on a whole systems level. No one's talking to you about that because you just want to get that property. You just want to buy that thing. You just want to invest in that thing. We're here together. I'm calling in hundreds and millions of financial commitments to build what's next. It's for this and future civilizations. If there is to be one, we've got to take back our communication systems, our health system, our food supply, our water, our healing capabilities, our telepathic capabilities, our psychic capabilities, our natural state of health and wellness. For those of you who would like to sponsor this segment, you can call 626-398-8652. Bruce and I will work on a video. We'll have this edited and I'll come back in the studio and acknowledge the sponsors in the front and the back end. And um, I want to thank you. My name is Kim Greenhouse. You've been listening to It's Rainmaking Time, the special segment called Healing for All Time. God bless you. <laughs>